All right, the big one. Literally. The Pimax Crystal, insane clarity coupled with foveated rendering and a good field of view, claiming to be the highest clarity VR headset in the world. So how does it fare in reality? As always, full disclosure, the Pimax Crystal is on loan to me for review, after which it will be returned to Pimax at no personal expense. You'll also find affiliate links below and discount codes on it should you wish to get one yourself in the description. So after six months of use, let's get to the core of it. Pimax has provided me with the standard 35 PPD lens model with optional DMAS headphones and basic controllers. The headset itself requires a USB free socket, display port and external power combined into a hub. Setup is relatively simple but not plug and play requiring Pimax's own software and Steam VR and optionally Pimax XR control center, OpenXR toolkit and quad views for DCS, which will be necessary to take full advantage and allow for more in-depth configuration. If you have more than two monitors plugged into your graphics card, you're going to need to software disable the third because otherwise the crystal will simply fail to communicate with your PC, which is not ideal, especially given my Valve Index works just fine with all monitors enabled. Up and running, let's talk build quality. It's pretty average, nothing blows me away here. The optional DMS off-ear headphones produce excellent sound and comfort, but should have been included for the base headset price in my opinion. Otherwise, it's a solid plastic construction with care taken to ensure wire fatigue is reduced with clever management of the PC umbilical cable. Adjustments are easily made with any ratcheted headband and Velcro contact points are basic foam however. I'd have liked to have seen fabric as foam is difficult to clean and insulates heat, collects sweat and dirt rapidly. And just like my old HTC Vive, eventually it's going to start grabbing unevenly at your skin as it degrades. They're connected via Velcro, which sadly for me, is already starting to come off the headset when I last removed the face pad for some video work, so frequent changes for cleaning will wear it out, requiring some new Velcro tape. This leaves a bit to be desired versus, say, the Valve Index's premium, magnetised and antimicrobial faceplate, so I'd strongly suggest replacing it with a third-party faceplate long term. And we probably should talk about the battery, right, yes, the, the battery. Whilst capable of running entirely standalone, I wouldn't bother. It also facilitates the ability to operate in a wireless mode, streaming to your PC, if you buy the upcoming Wi-Fi wireless kit for it. Without and tethered to your PC, it will trickle charge over the umbilical, depending on how powerful your USB socket is. Myself, I've been able to go a good 4 hours, and only see the battery drop to about 60%, which is plenty. After which it will slowly charge back up, it comes with a spare and charge pack if you need it. Battery swapping itself is a bit clunky with basic push tabs rather than anything more elegant. As standard, the headset relies on very convenient inside-out tracking via cameras. This has provided me a flawless experience, never has the headset wandered or desynchronized from my own movements. They're also used to track the basic controls, which, well, we'll talk about later. Finally, it's equipped with a free microphone array, which is of course what I'm recording this line with right now. Good quality with noise suppression and filtering out the sound from the headphones or breaths. Although, the bass volume is a little quiet. Moving inside, the headset features Toby eye tracking, enabling automatic IPD measurement and motorized adjustment every time you put the headset on, combined with the on-screen guidance to position it for a good picture, although not quite perfect, it'll help newcomers get a great visual experience. There's next to no light leak at all, and there's no nose gap to peek through either, nor double vision issues. Ironically, as the headset has no pass-through camera mode at the moment, this makes interacting with the real world much more of a chore, unless you remove the nose shield. Otherwise, you've got to pull the headset off and go through the auto setup when popping it back on. Of course, you can enforce a set IPD if you wish, skipping some of the setup. Now, before we get into lens images, be aware this is tricky. I simply cannot give you a true representation of what it looks like, owing to camera limitations and the dynamic rendering features. So let's talk the lenses. These are the 35 pixels per degree version, totaling 115 degrees horizontal and 105 vertical, which whilst fairly average is good enough for most uses, offering a wider field of view than the discontinued Varja Aero. You'll be able to look around without too much struggle or cranking your neck in most cases. The vertical fourth in particular is great. They give a clear picture, more or less edge to edge. Fantastic for glancing down at small gauges in the cockpit without having to turn your whole head. Very valuable in flight sims. There's some distortions, however, if you're away from the centre of the sweet spot. Starting with chromatic aberration, the splitting of light, and distortion warping your view around you as you stray further and further from the sweet spot. The sweet spot itself is large, and visually remains in focus within a large area compared to others. It's just that unless you are tightly centred, minor visual problems arise. 
The heft of the headset when moving rapidly will pull and displace the headset, resulting in minor chromatic aberration. This can, for example, make reading the colour of long-range lineup lights on a carrier a bit difficult as they will bleed together. The same for small details or text, requiring you to reseat the headset for best view. Generally, the image does not feel distorted, but a CAD or 3D artist might notice them in a strict environment. Additionally, if you look at the lens edge to edge, you'll always going to spot some chromatic operations around objects even when you are centered. The chromatic aberrations are the lens's greatest weakness. The chromatic aberration sweet spot is quite narrow, far smaller than the general focus sweet spot, and so poor eye alignment will cause artifacts even at the center of the displays. And vigorous movements can of course pull you off center, requiring frequent manual correction. This is probably the biggest potential deal breaker on visuals. Ultimately, the best way to see this is with your own eyes. Camera footage is not representative, and fortunately, Pimax operates showcases at various venues if you're lucky enough to be nearby. You can find a link in the description to learn more about these. Personally, none of this gives me cause for major concern, as all the lenses on all the VR headsets have their own compromises. The crystal lenses meet my expectations, and rarely do these flaws detract from my ability to see or my enjoyment. It's also fortunate enough not to suffer from light rays on bright objects, which is something my index did. So, the displays behind the lenses. This is where the crystal truly stands out above the competition, with the insane 2880 by 2880 pixels per eye. You'll easily be able to read every small detail in your cockpit of choice, or even read the details in the mid distance, like director lights with ease. This is unmatched by anything on the market for PC simming. Where it falters a little is the display backlight which being a mini QLED, means darkness will always be somewhat grey. They make use of local dimming to switch off the backlight in blocks, giving a true black colour, but this has its drawbacks. Using the extreme preset to exaggerate the issue, you can see here clearly the sky is in fact black, but the ground has a grey glow to it, extending a short distance into the sky. This isn't ground illumination, but the backlights. In a cockpit, this gets very disorientating. It's like looking at a distant light, in a dark night, in heavy fog. Everything will have a grey halo around it, which really warps your perception and washes out darker details. This is no replacement for an OLED screen, although no competing headset offers such at the moment. I'd personally not bother with local dimming or use minimum settings. It's just not a big selling point for me, preferring to live with the backlight glow. It operates in 72, 90 or 120 hertz modes with 72Hz being a good compromise for running highly demanding games at a reduced frame rate, while still maintaining a fluid picture under a synchronized frame generation, as is often required in simulation games. The crystal moves us out of the realm of short-sightedness that has plagued older VR headsets. In fact, it provides enough sight to legally drive in the UK, as discussed in my DCS stress test. This saves us from having to use VR zoom tools as often, keeping our depth perception and field of view wide. I can't really overstate just how clear this headset is. There's no pixelization or screen door to speak of, nor is there any ghosting or blurring from fast motion. But this comes at a price. Performance costs of 5760 by 2880 are heavy, and this is where eye tracking comes into the rescue. For a small extra performance cost, we can use eye tracking to render only what we're looking at at full native resolution, with the peripheral being reduced. On a high resolution headset, this nets us a huge performance boost. I seriously would not consider a VR headset without eye tracking going forwards, it's simply required to run such resolutions efficiently. It was surprising to see just how hard I can cut the resolution of peripheral vision without any perceived loss in clarity, anything outside the fovea, the central area of your vision, is simply perceived in significantly less detail anyway, so you just don't notice. You might think, but I'll see the resolution change as I look around with my eyes. But in actuality, our eyes go blind briefly to filter out the blur of rapid movements, the circadic masking effect, which, so long as the eye tracking and renderer can deliver a new frame within, say, 30 to 40 milliseconds, you simply won't see it happen unless your frame rate drops below playable levels, giving full resolution no matter where you look. A frame rate of, say, 36 will give you a 28 millisecond frame time, which keeps that dynamic foveation effect hidden, with one exception. Video games pull rendering tricks to ensure small details remain visible at all resolutions, in particular distant lights, tracers, or spotting dots. Combine this with dynamic resolution and, in effect, you'll see these objects get larger in our peripheral vision. In this example, the purple dot shows the centre of our full res render, and as objects pass into the mask, they become darker. This is a little odd to experience every time you look at them, going dimmer as if they have stage fright, only to get brighter as you look away. 
This can only be combated by raising the peripheral vision at performance cost, at least until developers learn how to fully utilise dynamic foveated rendering properly. To that, not every game supports the dynamic resolution features, and in these situations you're just going to have to beat the performance cost or lower your total resolution, losing out on that picture quality. Alright, so let's talk room scale. This is not the Crystal's strong suit, the basic controllers are not worth your time. They're perfectly adequate for a pointer or casual gaming, but they're flawed. First, the tactile feedback of the trigger and grip is very sloppy. But more seriously, the tracking is simply awful, it wobbles too much for accurate shooting at a distance, and the field of view from the headset sensors more or less forces you to look at your own hands whenever you're doing something. This is highly frustrating, being notably worse than the Quest 3's controller tracking. Being used to 360 degree external lighthouse tracking, I simply cannot tolerate it, with it simply losing track and interrupting play. Couple this with the lack of proper room scale, and that you have to set up your standing scale space every time you start the headset, I'd strongly recommend against room scale, unless you pick up the expensive lighthouse tracking conversion kit and compatible controllers like Pimax's sword controllers. With these, my main complaints would be resolved. However, this is where comfort becomes a factor, you see, it's a large headset, and rapidly shifting your head around, you're going to feel the weight and inertia falling behind your own motion. This puts slight pressure on the sides of your face, and slowly unseats you from the sweet spot. Pimax offer a top comfort strap which might help on this, which I may review later. If you're sitting still however, the headset is actually really comfortable, it sits nicely on your head, and it doesn't produce any discomfort over time, and is even evenly distributed. Arguably more comfortable than my old Valve Index, right up until the point you get physical. The second factor is the heat. The foam pad covers a large area of your forehead trapping heat, you're going to feel sweat sooner, and smaller headsets. This coupled with the warmth from the displays, you're going to sweat a lot more in physical games, it's simply unavoidable. Provided you can keep your room at a decent temperature, in seated games though, this is not really an issue. With the headset, they include a low profile foam pad. This significantly reduces the heat effect, but at a price. It's now less comfortable. Your film will pressure on your face and it drops below the comfort of my old index and you still have to deal with the ambient heat of the headset itself, which you can actually feel radiating off it, which puts it behind the index or the quest for heat management and comfort overall to me, outside of cockpit use with the full size pad anyway. This boils down to the basic crystal really being only suited for seated cockpit simulation games, to which it does really, really well. Otherwise, if you're going all in with lighthouses, conversion kit and sword controllers, it'll do the job, but at incredible cost versus the competition, I'd certainly go for a quest free or even the index over the crystal for a dedicated room scale VR, not least because the extra resolution does less for you when most room scale VR games are designed for lower resolutions in the first place. With almost 6 months of use, let's talk reliability. Now sadly Pimax do not have a perfect history as a company with quality control and customer support issues in the past. The general consensus is that they are maturing as a company and improving on these topics, but something that ultimately is hard to measure given people with problems will be far more communicative on this online than those who are satisfied. Myself, I feel reasonably confident of the Crystal and Pimax at this point. In general, Pimax products have had a feel of early access, or as a dev kit might, and some variance in quality. The Crystal, whilst a little unfocused in design, is for the most part a very solid bit of kit, improving on older designs. Software updates have been adding features, and there's a lot of optional extras to purchase or customise and expand on its capabilities even if it's not quite as premium feeling as the price tag. Far as issues go, the aforementioned foam is my only issue physically, with the tape already getting tired, but one cheaply fixed and the rest being software. Of which, I've had static flash up on one of my eyes for frame, or simply stuck on my vision on a couple of occasions, the cause being unknown, and simply disappearing with a restart or driver update. There is a known issue with NVIDIA RTX 3090s requiring a display signal booster, though this shouldn't be impacting my 3080. And on a few occasions I've had confusion whilst trying to get the headset to boot up, only to get no communication in addition to the multi-monitor issue. The Pimax Crystal is an incredible headset. It's probably the best overall simulation headset on the market right now, especially after the Vaja Aero retired from production in January. It's certainly not the most refined nor the most premium feeling with features I personally would expect missing on the base price. But what it did spend the budget on, the eye tracking and what it does with those displays, the highest resolution, highest pixels per degrees, it's unmatched. Whilst I'd rather have had the DMES headphones as standard and the face pads of better construction and, well, I'd be perfectly happy with manually mechanical adjusted IPD instead and no batteries needed, it is the king right now. There's simply no better headset for sale when it comes to vision and performance, 
its comfort is great outside the physically demanding, strong vertical field of view against its peers, and that the simplicity of not needing lighthouses for just the headset makes it easy to set up and run in your home. For those of you looking for a top-end VR simulations, I'd strongly consider the SIM bundle which skips the controllers and then adds the optional DMAS headphones. For room scale, it's a much harder sale, given that I wouldn't want to use it without the lighthouse conversion. In this realm, the Quest 3 wins out for price, and the aging index for the best room scale support and tracking. It's an incredibly expensive bit of kit that largely delivers on its promise, certainly a high-end enthusiast item. For those of you looking for the best of VR simming right now. Below in the description you'll find links to their store including codes for discounts and a limited time offer for free comfort top strap if you're so inclined. If you fancy checking out my other videos, I did a DCS stress test specific to the crystal. I hope you enjoyed, and take care.